1969, Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking wrote a classic paper showing that under certain conditions, there must be a singularity that marks the beginning of time at the Big Bang. Ten years later, theologian William Lane Craig used this to argue for the existence of God. But since then, both Penrose and Hawking have rejected the notion of a Big Bang singularity. Penrose now argues for a cyclic universe. Even if you don't understand the details of his model, it's not hard to see it's a cyclic cosmology, as the title suggests. The model works by asserting that at the Big Bang, and in the far future of an expanding cosmos, there will be no massive particles, only photons. And so one cannot build a conventional ruler or clock. One has to switch to a different type of geometry, known as conformal geometry. It's a familiar concept to cosmologists, but far removed from our everyday experience. Conformal geometry is concerned with shapes irrespective of their size. So consider a triangle. You can say that its angles sum to 180 degrees, even if you know nothing of its size. Or imagine we stretch this small chessboard so that it's the size of this large one. A chessboard, of course, is a conceptual thing which could be big or small. You see some big ones in parks sometimes. Uh, and, that's only, and you see little tiny miniature set, chess sets, and it's the same game. That's the point. That it doesn't depend on the scale of the board. On formal play, then it will be like this, that you will lose the time of particular move, but what you will have, you will have ratio of the, of the distances between, between particular pieces, and you will have ratio of times between particular move. This new geometry is used to imply that the far future of an expanding universe is equivalent to the Big Bang, and these can be joined together, giving us an infinite cyclic cosmology. William Lane Craig was asked about this on his podcast. The model is so new that it still remains to be fully explored and assessed. But I think we can say that it does not show that the universe is past eternal. James Sinclair, in our article in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology... James Sinclair is Craig's frequent collaborator on cosmological matters. You will look at the, author that I co or the article I co-authored with James Sinclair, who I is did. a physicist. While it is debatable whether his master's degree in physics makes him a physicist, he is certainly no cosmologist, as even Sinclair himself asserts. Our final speaker is James Sinclair. James is currently a warfare analyst for the United States Navy. Okay, I am a modeler by trade. I'm employed by the United States Navy. My field is artificial intelligence and the creation, maintenance, and analysis of results from sophisticated models of air combat. I work with teams of subject matter experts, each an individual expert in their field, much as Dr. Carroll is an expert in cosmology. So I don't stand in relation to this problem the way that he does. I'm not a cosmologist, but what I am is a knowledge integrator who interviews subject matter experts. He argues that on Penrose's cosmology, wholly apart from its, its physical problems, it's not clear at all that these other cycles are chronologically prior to our Big Bang. Rather, it seems that what is described here would be more like a multiverse model in which you have, so to speak, twin expanding universes coming out of a common origin point so that you do not have one universe chronologically prior to the other. Rather, they both share a common beginning before which there is not anything, and then you have a sort of branching or multiverse structure. We put these criticisms to Sir Roger. There is not anything, and then you have a sort of branching or multiverse structure. Mm -hmm. So our impression is that this is not an accurate representation of the CCC model, and we just want to be sure is that correct? You're correct. That is a very uh, inaccurate. It sounds very inaccurate. <laughs> no, I should say that CCC is definitely not a multiverse model in okay. the 
form that people put it. They have sort of parallel universes. These are sequential. It's completely different. In CCC, it's conceivable that there, there is no beginning and no end to the eons, that they go on forever. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. In fact, that's the picture I would present. Infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas but are real, the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back and back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. Well, you see, when you take the conformal picture, you can treat infinity. I mean, people don't like infinity often, you see. And this maybe a lot of people say, well, there isn't really an infinity or something. I don't know, I'm more open-minded about this. You see, mathematically, infinity is an incredibly useful thing. And, if, and you have infinitesimal infinity. I mean, you can't do calculus without imagining things could get infinitely small. And whether things can get infinitely big or not, well, we don't know. I mean, the universe might be infinite in spatial extent. And the evidence does seem to be that that likely to be the case. I, I mean, we don't really know. But, um, but as far as the the infinite time, you, you just take a conform. You see, it depends on how you're measuring the time. See, if you're measuring the time with a clock, and if a clock depends on particles' masses, then you've got to be a bit careful, because if the mass does the fade, fade away, then that clock will actually measure that infinite time as though it were a finite time. <laughs> but then maybe that's not the right kind of clock to use. So you've got to be careful. But if it's just this conformal structure, which doesn't involve a scale of time at all, it's just a, it, basically it's the speed of light. <laughs> the speed of light is a definite thing, and if you squash down the time, you have to squash the distance down so as to keep the speed the same, if you like. So that, that's uh, the fundamental thing you have in the conformal picture. And then infinity is no big deal. Almost three years after our video, William Lane Craig broadcast his response. You can't really say that these universes that are stacked up are sequentially ordered in time. Rather, there is time in each universe that runs from the Big Bang to infinity. And there isn't a kind of hyper time in which these are all then sequentially ordered. So Sinclair writes this, we may as well just interpret his model as having a reversed arrow of time when looking to the past of a Big Bang singularity so as to obey a second law of thermodynamics. Extendability by this understanding would be a technical artifact rather than an indication of past eternity. So he's saying that even though you could trace an extendable line through these different sequences or universes, they don't really stand in temporal order to each other. And it was very interesting in the interview with Penrose, did you notice what he said? He says, as you go into the past, there becomes a time at which mass first becomes relevant. And then he says, before that, <laughs> mass was not relevant and so there was no time. Now, on the face of it, that's logically incoherent. It, it's logically incoherent to say before that, there was no time. Sinclair claims to be a knowledge integrator, interviewing experts for greater understanding. Well, that is exactly what we did when we returned to see Sir Roger and other physicists who work in the field. It is logically incoherent to say before that there was no time. So how do you respond to that? I'm afraid this is a misunderstanding. I think that this misunderstanding. No, this criticism is based on some misunderstanding. The conformal picture, there's still a notion of before and after. It, the, the causal relationships are unaffected. That is to say, if A is before B, on say, take, say a world line, um, then that means, suppose you have a particle, and this can, it could be a photon even. And then the, the photon's history, you think of as a line in space-time, it has, still has a notion of which is prior, which event on that world line is prior to which other event. So there's an ordering. There isn't a scale which tells you, you know, how many seconds there is between this and this. There is still a temporal ordering. 
So I think the criticism is simply a misconception here. I don't think that's a valid criticism. Let me explain why. Uh, in geometry and relativity, we talk about something we call the causal structure. That tells us what happened before and what happened after, which events can cause other events. Um, the way this is described in special and general relativity is by a notion of a light cone. See, nothing can move faster than light. So we could only have been causally affected by events which took place in our past light cone. You then have to think what happens with the light cones in conformal geometry. Well, what happens is the following. The notion of distance or time is not really there. However, the light cones haven't changed. That's the whole point of conformal geometry, but, but they don't. The null surfaces, trajectories of photons stay the same. <laughs> Although the geometry inside the light cone and outside the light cone have been distorted, it's still, because of continuity of space-time, meaningful to say, in conformal framework, that something was inside or outside the light cone. So the causal relations haven't been um, distorted. I think we can go a bit further than that. It is claimed in the conformal cyclic cosmology models that some events which took place in the previous eon directly affected what happened in our, other in our eon. So conformal geometry, whilst it gives up a distance, it has still this causal structure preserved and you can make sense of before and after. So to say that there is no time, so we cannot say whether one is after or one is before, it's a misunderstanding because in the next eon, massive particles would look for backward into light cones, backward light cones, and would see suddenly the traces of a collision of a black hole. So the notion of time is very well, uh, let's say, settled. Or... It's conformal eon, it is known what was first, what was after. So it is, it is, it is, it is well defined how to glue one eon to the other. The main criticism, if I use the word no time, what I meant is there's no scale of time. It's not that there's no time. There is another point I should make, though. It's quite useful to talk in terms of a, a conformal time. You see, there is a way of, of introducing a pretty good notion of time, which is not the ordinary scale of time, but it's the, in a conformal diagram. You, you, you scale everything so that the speed of light is drawn in the picture as the lines were 45 degrees. And, and then you can measure up in this picture and, and that's useful to say when something happens on this conformal time. So the conformal time is, is not measured in seconds, but it's a, a measured as a, there is a way of doing it in, in a perfectly good mathematical sense. So, so there's, there's nothing wrong with what I said. It just involves notions which uh, y you can't just dismiss by saying, oh, there's no time, so it means nothing. I'm afraid it's, it's misconceived. In 2014, Craig debated atheist cosmologist Sean Carroll, who claimed skepticism about whether the universe was really fine-tuned for life. Craig responded that other physicists were convinced, including Sir Roger Penrose. But is he? Here Dr. Carroll expresses skepticism that the fine-tuning is real. But a good many, if not most, of his colleagues would simply disagree with him here. Slide 37. Luke Barnes provides a list of just some of the scientists who have published works in defense of the reality of fine-tuning. There's this thing called the anthropic principle, which might say, well, we're only in that eon where these numbers have exactly the right values, where life could come about, and if you change monkey with these numbers too much, life wouldn't happen. Now, I think it's a bit of a dangerous argument because we have no idea what life would be like, even with these numbers. We don't know enough about life to know that it would never necessarily come about with the numbers that we see. We don't know enough about it to say it wouldn't come about with other numbers. So I, I think it's a dangerous argument to use. There may be another reason why they have these values, which is purely mathematical. We just don't know. So there are big questions here, which are interesting to talk about, but I don't think you can make any big conclusion from them. Craig and his colleague, Rob Collins, often argue the low entropy of the Big Bang supports their argument for God from the fine-tuning of the universe. But their opponent, Carol, 
argued they had it backwards. The entropy of the early universe is exactly backwards when it comes to being an argument for fine tuning according to theology. Dr. Craig quotes me in a gotcha moment. He quotes me saying, look, the early universe was finely tuned with a low entropy. That is absolutely true. The point that I raised was not that there is not fine tuning. It's that there's no evidence the fine tuning is for life to exist. Indeed, the maximum possible, possible entropy of the part of the universe we observe is this huge number, 10 to the 122. The entropy that you would need is a little bit lower than that if you wanted life to exist. But it's almost the same. It's 0.999, et cetera, times the maximum entropy. Whereas the actual entropy of the early universe is enormously smaller than that. There's absolutely no reason why the universe would look like this if the fine tunings were put there in order for life to exist. I'm not saying there's not fine tunings, I'm saying they're not there for life. As Craig and Collins often quote Sir Roger Penrose in their argument, we thought we should see if he agrees with Carroll's critique or not. It's really, really gross, coarse tuning. The, the entropy in the gravitational field is ridiculously small compared with um, the entropy in matter. Uh, it, it's, there's nothing fine-tuned about it, it's just huge. What you were saying was, yes. people had argued there are these constants, they're fine-tuned for life, and he said, well, hang on, look at the entropy, that could be much, much higher, and life would still be here, so that's not yes. fine-tuned for life. Therefore, we see something that no, clearly isn't. I absolutely Would you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that, yes. The entropy could, in gravitational field, could have been far larger without disturbing life, as far as I can see. That's something I agree with. <laughs> <laughs> Much of the footage in this film comes from our film on Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology. You can see that by clicking on the links below.